we will get started here. So thank you all for joining tonight. I will say that this recorded this webinar is being recorded and will be on our YouTube if you need to go back uh, and revisit anything mentioned in the presentation tonight. Uh, so, hello, my name is Hannah Mortensen, and I am the Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility Wisconsin and the Wisconsin Environmental Health Network, also called WEN or WEHN. And WEHN is the environmental arm of PSR Wisconsin. At WEN, we seek to educate health professionals and advocates on the effects of environmental toxins and contaminants as well as the effects of climate change on public health. WEN strives to bring the health voice to environmental issues and advocacy efforts. And for that reason, we wanna thank all of our donors and our volunteers and members that have supported us um, in the past, have supported us this year. You are the ones that make events like this happen um, and support our work. So tonight we are joined by Mark Borchardt and Tucker Birch. Uh, and you can see Mark on your screen there, and Tucker is also to the side. They are in the same office. We are joined for them for a presentation on their recent studies, and we will have time for a question and answer at the end of the presentation. You're welcome to submit questions at any time using the Q&A box, which is located on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then just a reminder, that when Mark and Tucker share their presentation slides, you are able to adjust the zoom ratio, um, how close you want to be on the slides and further out. There is an option at the top of your uh, zoom window once they start sharing. And again, you can also move a slider back and forth uh, to view Mark and Tucker as bigger or smaller and the presentation. So those are some logistics. Um, Mark, is a research microbiologist at the United States Department of Agriculture. At the USDA, Mark is the director of the Laboratory for Infectious Diseases and the Environment and located in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Tucker is a research agricultural engineer in the Department of Environmental Integrated Dairy Management Research at the USDA. So at this time, I'm gonna turn over the presentation to Mark and Tucker and they will be sharing slides. Okay, thank you, Hannah. I'm going to share the slides here. Oops, how did that don't work? I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to. Um, do a right click here and see if I can get the um, pointer. Oh shoot, oh, that didn't work. One more time. You see my pointer, Hannah? Yep, I do see it. You're good. Oh, good, okay, thank you. Uh, so yes, my name is Mark Borkhart and I'm gonna be the lead off speaker tonight in this joint presentation between myself and Tucker. And we're gonna talk about this study that I've been working on for the last five years, uh, Tucker for the last couple of years, dealing with this question of uh, dairy manure and septic systems and uh, the microbial health risk. And we're focusing on private household wells in Kewaunee County, Wisconsin. I have spoken about this topic, well, I stopped counting at a hundred times. Uh, so you probably have heard much of this before um, or you've read about it in the newspaper. What we want to focus on tonight is Tucker's work and Tucker's findings, and I'll introduce that by the, by the uh, virtue of these next few slides. This is our research team. Uh, we're called the Laboratory for Infectious Disease in the Environment. We're located in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Um, here's our logo, and what we do is we study the occurrence, transport, and health effects of human and agricultural zoonotic pathogens in the environment, and we work actually all over the world. Uh, interestingly, this study in Kewaunee, Wis Kewaunee County, Wisconsin has had ramifications worldwide for understanding uh, groundwater contamination and the public health risks associated with private well and drinking water consumption from private wells. So we're focusing on Kewaunee County, which is over here in red. Let me get rid of this piece. 
Uh, the population in the county is about 20,000 folks, of which 12,000 have a private household well. Those same people with the private well have a septic system. So there's thousands of septic systems. And this is also a very uh, good area for the dairy industry in terms of milk production. There's about 100,000 cattle. So there's the two land uses here are suburban homes and the dairy industry. And they share this aquifer, which is a fractured Silurian dolomite aquifer. The aquifer is very productive in the amount of water that it provides uh, given its fractures. Uh, but the downside is because of that fracture, of those fractures, it's also vulnerable to contamination and particularly microbial contamination from septic systems and dairy manure. For some reason, maybe it's because it's the World Series tonight, I've got baseball on my mind. So the way I'm going to portray what we've done here with this study is using a baseball diamond. And right now you can see on the, on the slide that um, a first base hit from home, from home to first, um, we've accomplished that. And that is assessing the scope of private well contamination with nitrate and bacterial indicators. That is something that maybe if I had to count, there's probably 50 to 70 papers in the scientific literature that have done this, that have used, that have assessed the rate of contamination for nitrate and, um, and bacterial indicators of sanitary quality. We did it in a little different way in Kewanee County in that we looked at the wall of depth to bedrock and the contamination rate. And that's what this table is showing. By depth to bedrock, I mean from the land surface where the well is located to the top of the bedrock, how deep is that soil layer? Because the deeper the soil layer, the more likely the contaminants are going to be attenuated. So for our, for our sampling campaign in the county, we divided up the wells by these three categories of depth to bedrock less than five feet, five to 20 feet, and more than 20 feet. And what you can see is that for some of these indicators of sanitary quality and nitrate, that the shallower the depth of bedrock, the greater the contamination rate. So for total coliforms, which is a bacterial indicator, if there's a contamination problem with the well, and for wells with less than five feet depth of bedrock, the contamination was 46%. And for those wells as with increasing depth of bedrock, with those with greater more than 20 feet, it's only about 19%. This study done by Linda Knobloch, which maybe some of you, some of you know, uh, published in 2013, the statewide average in Wisconsin is an 18% contamination rate. Let's take a look here at nitrate in this column here. What did we measure? What I did is we looked at the nitrate level that exceeds the health standard of 10 parts per million. And for those wells less than five feet with depth of bedrock, the contamination rate was 7%. For five to 20, 20%, the statewide average is 10%. We think it's so high here at this weight because this is where most of agriculture is in this five to 20 feet depth of soil. Overall, if you look at whether a well was positive for either a coliform bacteria or had a high nitrate level greater than the health standard, that is a well that probably you shouldn't be drinking the water from, for those wells with less than five feet depth of bedrock, more than half of those exceeded, exceeded these standards. So we accomplished that first task and that from home base to first base. The second thing we did is we determined the sources of the fecal contamination, whether the contamination was from dairy manure or from septic systems. Again, if I was to count the scientific literature on that topic, I think there's three studies out there in private wells that have done this. What we learned, and this table summarizes the data, is of the wells, that, the 131 wells that we use these methods to determine the source of fecal contamination, it turns out it was split about 50-50. 44 wells were contaminated with uh, dairy manure, 33 wells were contaminated with human wastewater, and nine wells had both dairy manure and human wastewater. The 44, given these methods, the 44 isn't any different than the 33. So both sources of fecal contamination on the landscape are responsible for contamination of the private wells in Kewanee County. So making going around the bases now from second to third, we took yet another step in the studies and we identified risk factors for private well contamination. We looked at things like proximity to manure lagoons, area of the crop fields around the wells, the density of septic systems, 
And there's only one other study in the world that's done this. It was some work done in uh, Ireland. And what they looked at was total coliforms. Whereas we looked at these sources of fecal contamination. I'm just gonna show you one slide to give you a demonstration of the sort of thing that we've learned. Um, this is the relationship between the acres of crop fields around a well within a 750 foot radius and the probability of a well having a nitrate level greater than the health standard of 10 parts per million. You can look at the blue line here. This green line is the statewide average from another study, not Linda's study, but another study at 7%. And what you see is that the wells in Kewanee County, as more, as more land is in cropped, crops like corn and soybeans, et cetera, the more land surrounding a well, the greater the probability of having a nitrate level greater than the health standard. This 750 foot radius, if you do the math, that's 40 acres around a well. This is 36 acres. By the time a well is sur nearly surrounded by all cropped fields, um, it's about a 30% chance that that well is gonna have a nitrate level greater than the health standard. And for those of you that are statisticians or st st statistically inclined, this is a multivariable model, and we also accounted for these other factors like distance to a nearest crop field, distance to manure lagoon, and depth to bedrock. We did this for a number of outcomes, coliforms, human wastewater, dairy manure, and created all of these models, and this, for which this is just one example. And then lastly, to bring it home, we did these three, we ran to first, we ran to second, we ran to third, but to bring it all home, what we did, what Tucker did, is he took this microbial data and he calculated the health risk for these walls contaminated with these gastrointestinal pathogens. And no one else has done that before. We're very pleased uh, to have accomplished that task, to hit this home run. What this has resulted in are two papers. They're published together in Environmental Health Perspectives. Uh, these are free, you can find them online if you'd like to look at the scientific details. This first paper, Sources and risk factors describes that uh, running to third base. And I led on this paper. Here are the co authors for which we all have gratitude for their work. And then the second paper, Tucker's paper, does the, mic the microbial risk assessment for the amount of health risk from these con uh, contaminated wells. So, with that introduction, I'm going to give it to Tucker now to talk about the uh, health risk piece that run from third base to home. Thank you, Mark. All right, so to estimate risk, <clears throat> we use an approach called quantitative microbial risk assessment or QMRA. Uh, and to define QMRA, I think it helps to first define the word risk. You see the dictionary definition here on the screen. And if you look at it closely, it's saying that risk is the product of two distinct quantities, a probability, which is a probability of exposure to a hazard, um, along with some measure of damage, which is some measure of how severe the hazard is if you are in fact exposed to it. The difference between a hazard and the risk associated with it is, a still, is illustrated in the graphic on the right. Um, and if we put these ideas together, they provide useful context when thinking about QMRA, which is estimation of risk for microbial hazards. The hazards in this case are often foodborne or waterborne gastrointestinal pathogens like cryptosporidium or salmonella. And for gastrointestinal pathogens, the types of damage we're normally concerned with are infections and illnesses, where infection can be either, can be either symptomatic or asymptomatic, and illness is a symptomatic infection. In many hosts, AGI is often self-limiting, meaning it resolves on its own without special medical treatment, um, but it still causes an important health and economic burden at the population level, and it can also be more severe in certain types of highly susceptible hosts like the immunocompromised children and the elderly. Procedurally, QMRA is normally described as consisting of four steps, which you see listed here. The first step, <clears throat> excuse me, sets the scope of a QMRA by identifying the specific infectious organisms and exposure routes of interest. Exposure assessment quantifies the degree of exposure, the dose, and those results are then plugged into pathogen-specific dose response models in step three in order to predict this, the probability of the health outcome under study. Finally, in the last step, risk estimates are summarized in terms relevant to the research objectives. Big picture, the most important thing to understand about this approach is that fundamentally, it's a mathematical modeling approach. 
Um, that means we're making a scientifically educated best guess. That doesn't mean that we're not careful about how we generate our results or that the results are unreliable or only abstract. It does mean that we need to do two very important things. First, we need to support our mathematical predictions with as much empirical information as possible. And second, we need to check our predictions whenever we can. Um, so let's talk about how we did, did those two things in Kiwanee County. And let's start uh, by identifying our research question, which is actually quite simple. Given that private wells in Kiwanee County are contaminated by waterborne pathogens, and that people are drinking the water, what's the risk? What's the risk of gastrointestinal illness among those residents drinking their well water? So looking again at QMRA's four steps, the unique part for this study was really how we did the first two, hazard identification and exposure assessment. Uh, dose response assessment in pretty much all QMRAs is normally extrapolated from other studies. And the risk character characterization really has to do with how we put all our numbers together at the end. In our case, the important part with respect to risk characterization is that we're estimating total cases of illness per year among the 12,000 people that consume water from private wells in the county. But the hazard identification and exposure assessment are based on empirical data specific to the county. Uh, and, in, and these steps are what ground our risk estimates in reality. So I'd like to highlight them on the next couple of slides. For hazard identification, our hazard is waterborne pathogens in groundwater obtained from private wells. And you see on this list the eight different pathogens we included in our study, all of which were detected in private well samples from the county. Some of them are specific to humans like adenovirus and cryptosporidium hominis. Uh, so these are pathogens that we would only expect to find in sewage or septic effluent. And some of them are zoonotic. So these could be present in human fecal material and dairy manure or even wildlife. Um, and so the point here is that we covered all the bases in terms of the potential fecal sources. Uh, as I said, the other unique aspect here was the exposure assessment. And this part's uh, important because of the empirical field data we had, we were able to stratify our risk, our <clears throat> stratify our exposure assessment by two factors that we thought might be important from the beginning, which were depth to bedrock and fecal source. Depth to bedrock represents the amount of overlying soil on top of the aquifer. And this soil provides attenuation of surface contaminants. Essentially, more soil means longer microbial transport times and more potential attenuation. We have this data for every well in the study from publicly available well construction reports, and we have our exposure assessment and related risk estimates stratified into two categories, either less than 20 feet or greater than 20 feet. Fecal source was determined based on qPCR analysis of the same samples we quantified pathogens in, um, only instead of looking for zoonotic or human pathogens, Dr. Borkard and his team looked for source-specific fecal markers. Ideally, this approach allows us to classify all the pathogen detections as being associated with either a human or a bovine fecal source. But in some cases, the fecal source was unknown, which happened when pathogens were detected with either both fecal sources or sometimes with neither. Um, so that was just a few slides on the approach. There's really a lot more detail to the methods that isn't possible to get into right now, but in the interest of time, I'd like to move on to results. So I'm just gonna pause here to give an indication of where we're headed. Uh, I'll start with two sets of intermediate results that will help frame things. First will be our estimates of how many people in the county are exposed per day to water from private wells with high coliform and or nitrate levels. And I'll follow that up with our estimates of average daily pathogen doses for residents consuming water from those wells. Then we'll get into the heart of the matter and talk about the actual risk estimates. And at the end, something that's crucial for this study because of its novelty, which is context, um, along with some high level policy implications. So for exposure assessment, we had two major quantities that we were interested in. And the first was the number of residents exposed to contamination each day, which you see here. Just to remind you, in the context of this study, we have a very specific operational definition for, for the word contamination, uh, which refers to private well water containing any coliform bacteria or more than 10 milligrams per liter of nitrate. Countywide, more than 3,000 residents were estimated to be exposed to contaminated private well water each day. Uh, you get that number from adding up all the totals in the rightmost column of this table. 
And those individual totals for individual combinations of depth to bedrock and fecal source were really variable. They ranged from 140 to more than 1,400 people per day. Uh, one more slide or one more point with this slide uh, that will turn out to be important later. By depth to bedrock, almost 2,400 people per day were exposed in the greater than 20 feet category. That's more than 75% of daily exposures. That might sound a little contrary to expectations because we know that contamination is more likely in the shallow depth to bedrock category. And in fact, you can see that in the table, looking at column four, we're estimating about 41% of wells are contaminated when depth to bedrock is, is less than or equal to 20 feet, while only 24% are contaminated at greater than 20 feet. So what's going on here? These exposure estimates account for more than just contamination. They also account for the number of wells in each depth to bedrock category and the number of people drinking water from each well. More specifically, they reflect the fact that very few people have their wells drilled in shallow depth to bedrock. Only 680 wells in the county out of close to 5,000 total. So yes, contamination is more likely at shallow depth to bedrock by a factor of about two, but that lower contamination rate is more than made up for by the fact that six times as many people get their drinking water from wells drilled in the deeper depth to bedrock category. Um, keep that in mind, I'll circle back to it later. Uh, the second quantity we were interested in with exposure assessment is the daily exposure dose for each pathogen. This is an estimate of how many infectious organisms an individual is exposed to in drinking water from their private well each day on average. Uh, and you can see in this table that predicted daily doses varied quite a bit by fecal source, by depth to bedrock, and by pathogen. Many were equal to zero. And I have a few examples of those zeros highlighted with the boxes here, just to demonstrate that we're not estimating extraordinarily high doses across the board. <clears throat> for those daily doses that weren't equal to zero, the highest exposure levels were for Salmonella and Cryptosporidium parvum, generally on the order of 10 to the minus two infectious organisms per person per day. I have those cases highlighted here. So what does that mean? Let's take crypto as an example. 10 to the minus two is one in 100. So if the average daily dose for cryptosporidium is, is 10 to the minus two osis per person per day, that means for every 100 people per day, only one out of those 100 would actually be exposed to an oocyst. The other 99 would all be exposed to zero and be at zero risk that day for a cryptosporidium infection or illness. Offhand, that actually makes it sound like risk here must be zero or at least very low. But there's one more concept, one more component of the risk assessment that has to be considered, which is cumulative risk. And by that, I'm referring to the sheer force of numbers involved when you account for risk comprehensively. So accumulation of risk across 365 days of exposure per year, across a population of 12,000 private well users, and across all eight pathogens included in the study. Which brings us to our main results, our predictions for total annual cases of illness in the county due to consuming contaminated drinking water from private wells. And I haven't mentioned this up to now, but we're specifically trying to predict cases of AGI, which is acute gastrointestinal illness, uh, and defined by symptoms of vomiting, diarrhea, or both. Countywide, this study predicted a total of roughly 300 AGI cases per year due to contaminated private wells. By individual pathogen, the largest number of cases was associated with Cryptosporidium parvum, which was predicted to cause 190 cases per year. Most of those were associated with bovine fecal contamination at more than 20 feet depth of bedrock. Another important point, more cases were predicted to occur when depth of bedrock was greater than 20 feet compared to when it was less than or equal to 20 feet, 83% in fact. Uh, of these cases were predicted to occur for wells drilled in deeper depths to bedrock. So that's a large chunk of the overall risk. And I will come back to that in a few slides. Uh, and a final point with respect to results. If you add up predicted cases by fecal source and across depth bedrock categories, you can see that more cases were predicted to associate with a bovine fecal source, about 230 per year for bovine um, versus 12 per year for human. And it's also worth noting a relatively large number of predicted cases, 59 per year, couldn't be associated with either fecal source um, because as I mentioned earlier, pathogens often co-occurred with both types of source specific fecal markers or neither. <clears throat> 
So that was results. That was a lot of ground to cover, and I know I covered it very quickly. Um, but now I want to step back and discuss a few of the key points and some questions they bring to mind. And this first one is tricky, but it's, it's also very important. So I'd like to address it head on. Uh, are these numbers high or low? Because on their own, without any sort of reference point, it's obviously hard to put them in context. The short answer here, and this is probably going to be dissatisfying for many people, but the short answer is that I can't give a definitive answer. Uh, it's just not that simple. Defining an acceptable risk threshold that you could use to judge these results is subjective uh, because the level of risk that people find acceptable at the individual level varies from one person to the next. And at a social level, the process of defining acceptable risk and incorporating it into policy is collective. Many different people have input. So it's not my role to give uh, blanket statements about the results being high or low, uh, but I can give information and I can give context um, and, and you have to take it the rest of the way. So context, uh, to start, there's no defined acceptable risk threshold for private wells in the US. We do have acceptable risk thresholds for two other situations that involve exposure to waterborne pathogens. The first is for public drinking water systems and that benchmark is one infection um, for every 10,000 people per year. It's not exactly a standard, uh, it's, it's probably better thought of as an ideal or a goal, but it's a conventional reference point in QMRAs that address drinking water. The second benchmark is for recreational water. So it relates to water quality at public beaches, for example. Uh, that value is 32 illnesses for every thousand people per exposure event, where an event is defined as a single recreational use, uh, like a single day swimming. Those two scales for our benchmarks are extremely different, uh, especially with respect to time. The drinking water scale looks at risk over the course of a whole year, and the rec water scale only looks at risk with respect to a single exposure event. So to compare these to our results and put everything on a common scale, we have to do some unit conversions. Most importantly, we have to define what a single exposure event is in the context of drinking water. I've done that uh, by saying that a single drinking water exposure is one day's worth of water consumption. That's conventional for drinking water QMRAs. And when we do that, you see that our risk estimates for private wells in Kewanee County fall pretty much exactly between the two benchmarks. Remember, neither benchmark is strictly applicable to the situation we're modeling. We're just using them for context. Uh, more context comes from other drinking water QMRAs. There's actually a lot of those types of studies out there. So if I showed everything, it'd be all over the map. Um, so instead of doing that, I've just picked a few of the most relevant estimates to compare to. For private wells, there's really only one other study to compare to, and that was a national level study for Canada that extrapolated pathogen concentrations from the published literature instead of measuring them uh, empirically like we have. Despite that, uh, however, you can see that our results are really quite close to theirs. Um, theirs are the red circle on this plot. Other relevant risk estimates come from public water systems in the US and Canada. So these are for public water utilities with centralized treatment and distribution systems. And they use a mix of surface water as well as groundwater. There's a wide range of prevailing risks in both countries, but you can see that in both cases, our current studies risk estimates fall within that range. So big picture, again, I can't tell you if our risk estimates for Kiwani are high or low, uh, at least not from the standpoint of making a value judgment, but I can tell you Kiwani County is not alone. Our risk estimates for private well users in Kiwanee County are consistent with the few national level assessments of drinking water in North America. Another question you may have, are these risk estimates realistic? The short answer is yes, and we have two lines of evidence. The first is based on comparing our predictions to the rate of acute gastrointestinal illness we could expect in the county due to all transmission routes and all sources. So not just from drinking water in private wells, but also foodborne illness, those that come from person-to-person -person contact and so on. You can see the numbers worked out on the slide and the upshot here is that when you work it all out, our prediction of 301 total cases from private wells probably represents about 4% of all AGI cases in the county. Our second line of evidence comes from comparing our predictions to counts of notifiable diseases in the county. And an important concept here is that infectious gastrointestinal illnesses in the US are underdiagnosed and underreported because not everyone that gets sick goes to see a doctor, not everyone that sees a doctor gets tested, 
and not all test results get reported to public health agencies. We have two pathogens in our study that correspond to notifiable diseases, cryptosporidium and salmonella. And I've worked out an example here using cryptosporidium, which suggests about 500 cryptosporidiosis cases per year countywide uh, and due to all transmission routes. Similar to the last slide, the conclusion based on our predictions, 250 cases due to waterborne transmission in private wells is within the range of what's plausible. Working out the salmonella example would lead to the same general conclusion. So the point here, and also with the previous slide, is that our predictions are not out to lunch. They are completely realistic and plausible given the sources of external data that we have to compare them to. And closing in on the home stretch, what are the implications of our results with respect to risk mitigation? I can't comment on specific policy or management options that may or may not work because we didn't look at things in that level of detail with this study. Um, but we can use our results to talk broadly about priority areas where risk mitigation might be most effective. And there are really three priorities based on our results. These correspond to the three largest sources of risk that we're predicting. The first is to address wells drilled in more than 20 feet depth of bedrock, which I mentioned before in the results. Again, this goes a bit against conventional wisdom because we know that the shallower depths to bedrock are more susceptible to contamination. But remember that the QMRA also accounts for the number of people exposed, and there are far more people with wells drilled in deeper depths to bedrock than shallow. Other priorities to address are private wells contaminated with bovine fecal material, as well as those contaminated by cryptosporidium parvum. Understanding the fecal source that pathogens are associated with, as well as which specific pathogen is driving risk, is important for thinking about things like treatment options at the source and at the tap. And one last point related to the previous slide. We're on conclusions. I'm just gonna jump straight down to item D uh, under the second conclusion there. The major priorities we're identifying are not mutually exclusive. So it could be that multiple risk mitigation efforts would be effective uh, and possibly even necessary to reduce risk considerably in this system. So that does it for the, uh, the presentation itself. Uh, just wanna say thank you and we're ready for questions. Great, thank you. And Tucker, you can stop sharing so that way we can see all three of us. And uh, again, a reminder for folks that you can submit any questions in the Q&A box. It's labeled Q&A and has two bubbles on the bottom of your screen. Um, and so I've actually got one in here already. It's from Catherine Zimmerman. And she said, if I have a new well put in recently and my last well had high nitrates, is there a possibility that those nitrates will still seep into my new well? And I'm not sure if you guys can answer that, but uh, we'll put it out there. I can take that on, Tucker. So one of the things that we looked at in Kewanee County were uh, well construction factors related to contamination. Things like uh, well age, uh, depth of the well, um, how deep the casing went, the pipe that goes into the ground, and what we found for that part of the state, I don't know where the questioner is from, but for that part of the state with this fractured uh, bedrock, the Silurian dolomite aquifer, well construction really didn't matter much. And we didn't find uh, much in the way of relationships between those well construction characteristics and contamination. If the questioner's well, previous well was out of code in any way, maybe it was a pit well or a super shallow well, then a new well might have some influence. But unfortunately, if the questioner is located in Northeast Wisconsin with that type of aquifer, uh, I'm sorry to say that it's probably not gonna have much effect. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, the next question we have is what is the future potential for identifying pathogens from specific dairy herds? Is there potential studies um, or anything you guys could see from specific dairy herds? Uh, I can answer that one. Uh, yes, a person, I mean, a research team can do that. Uh, the technology and the approach is called molecular epidemiology, where um, you try to form a link between a contamination source and the people that are infected. Um, there's various ways to do that. 
it's very common to do in foodborne outbreaks uh, to, do, to sample both the food and the people. Uh, we actually did that for a big outbreak in Door County, uh, the Log Den restaurant outbreak. We linked the norovirus that was in the uh, peoples that ate at the restaurant, uh, what was in their stool with what was in the well water. So we had a connection there. The key part to taking that approach is you need to be able to sample the suspected source. So um, if you suspect a certain septic system, you obviously have to get the property owner's permission uh, to sample that. If you suspect a certain dairy herd, you need to have permission from the producer uh, to sample that herd. Great, thank you. Um, some more questions are coming in, so here we go. <laughs> um, and the next one is, has your work led to any trials on mitigation or site studies to prevent contamination? And if so, have they been successful? Tucker, you want to deal with that one? Uh, well, I mean, we haven't, um, we haven't done any mitigation uh, trials so far. Um, I'm not exactly sure what type of, uh, are we talking about treatment systems in homes or? Um, maybe that could be one. I, I'm, I'm not sure. It's pretty open-ended. So anything you could see to contribute to that question. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the study, the way we did it here is, uh, in my mind, a bit of a first pass just to define the magnitude of the risk. Uh, and it would be wonderful to do follow-up studies looking at um, either policy or technology-based, you know, mitigation efforts. Um, but we're just um, we're not we're not there yet. Ah, got it. So it's essentially this is a first step going through. We got yeah. one home run, and now it's to get the others. Um, the next Boy. question I have is: Does the presence of a high-capacity well create a suction? of contaminants into groundwater in these private wells? I can perhaps address that, but although I'm not a hydrogeologist, um, but obviously a, the more a well pumps from the ground, the groundwater, the greater the area that it's drawing from, what's called the capture zone. And these wells interact. So one well can affect another well. So for example, if there was a private well and then down gradient, that is downstream, so to speak, uh, from the private well was a high capacity well, yes, um, it, could, it could do that. I mean, it could pull water in towards the private well. But the thing about this fractured bedrock aquifer is that no one knows where these fractures go. This is all underground and hidden. So how things are connected is almost impossible to say. So the hydrogeologists um, sometimes throw up their hands and say they, they, know they, they know on a regional scale how the water is flowing, but on a very local scale for an individual private well, uh, they don't unless they have extensive in-depth, uh, no pun intended, uh, studies. Great, thank you. Um, the next one is about related to the greater depth of some of these wells. And so when considering physical properties of soil, um, does the type of ground cover make a difference in terms of the amount of contaminants getting through to the wells? It probably does, although we didn't study that. Um, so we, in, these, in this risk factor analysis, the third part of the first paper, uh, we were limited by the data that is available to us. It turns out that Kiwani has an incredible data set that's publicly available on land use. And uh, much of the county has, the cropland has a nutrient management plan. So we were able to tell uh, which, which property, which land was cropped. But individual crops, where they were located and when, uh, we really didn't have that information. So I would suspect that would be the case to the extent that we can get that sort of data. Um, we could actually do a reverse study and not look at risk factors that relate to contamination, but we could look at best management practices related to uncontaminated wells. 
I mean, that's that would be a really nice study to do because then we could identify those things that um, leave wells in a cleaner state. The problem with that is getting that information. That's that's what's difficult. Thank you. Um, this is from Diane. She said, I do have chloroform bacteria in my well. The well is still newish from 2005, but near a CAFO and shallow soil. She said, I drink filtered water from a municipal source outside of Kiwani and tried to boil water when I wash foods. Do you know if there's any risk using water for bathing or rinsing mouth? And again, I'm not sure if you guys will know that answer, um, but just wanted to put it out there. Tucker, you want to address that? Yeah, so, you know, uh, it's hard to say anything specific about risk for one specific well. The study was looking at uh, a sample of wells across the county. Um, just based on the principles of the field I work in, I, I would say there is probably some risk, how high or low it is relative to the county average or uh, how high or low it is compared to say drinking the water versus I think the question was about bathing. Um, it, you know, it's, it's hard to say without, well, there's really nothing we can say without data specific to that well, but it, it, there's probably some risk, yes. I could add, if I could add to that, I mean, one of the things we did show, and that's published in that first paper, is that there is strong relationships between coliform bacteria contamination and dairy manure, specifically um, manure lagoons. And coliform by themselves are not pathogenic. They do not present a health risk, but they are in fecal material. Not necessarily, but they are in high numbers in fecal material. So if I was that person and the well is near a place where there's either a manure lagoon or land where manure is being applied and there's a persistent coliform problem, it, it's likely that there's also pathogens associated with that. So a solution in that case would be to um, install probably a UV, UV disinfection, an ultraviolet light disinfection unit. Thank you both. Um, this next question really relates to the health piece. Uh, have you reported your findings and information to healthcare professionals at the county or state level? Um, and if so, how have you done that? And Yes, that, I think that's the rest of it. Yes, so have you reported information to healthcare professionals at the county or state level? Um, no, not, uh, we have not. Uh, we pre what we have done is we've published these two scientific papers uh, that are in a top tier journal that's peer reviewed. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to publish there was because the articles are free. So anyone can access them. Uh, but uh, to, to talk to specific counties, no, we have not. Although we have spoken frequently about these findings. Thank you. And we're hoping with this presentation, we reach <laughs> even more people, right? Um, the next question I have is, uh, it was mentioned earlier um, about mo molecular epidemiology. Uh, the question is, is the use of molecular epidemiology expensive? Um, and in the case of these studies, who paid for the studies? Uh, the second part first, uh, the studies were funded by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources um, and also some uh, USDA funds fund, funded these. Um, and then Tucker's work was funded um, by, by USDA. So a mix, mixed source of funds. The molecular epidemiology work, um, it's, it, can be, it can be expensive. These are sophisticated lab methods. Uh, just to give you an idea for the sort of, of identification of fecal sources that we did, um, each sample is about $500 to $600 to analyze just one sample. To do that, uh, to determine the source of contamination, I'm going to ballpark it in the order of uh, a complete study uh, on the order of $10,000, $20,000, sorry to say. Yeah, it's good context to have, I think, for all of us to think about. Um, so the other question, um, it's kind of been mentioned twice here, is 
um, a little bit of difference between uh, bovine versus swine. So did you guys see, do you have a specific marker for uh, swine contamination um, and any findings with that if there was? Uh, yes, we do. And these markers that we use are all validated. That is, they've been tested against other fecal sources and they are peer reviewed and published in the scientific literature. Uh, so we did not invent the swine marker. We're using one that's established in the scientific literature. We did not use it in Kewanee County because there's very few pigs, but we are using it in the SWIG study, the Southwest Wisconsin study, which is a repeat of Kewanee County. Um, it's just doing it in Southwest Wisconsin. As long as I'm on that topic, Hannah, just so people are aware, in terms of that baseball diamond, for that SWIG study, the Southwest Wisconsin study, we're somewhere between second base and third base right now. We've done the first part, we've done the second part, we've identified the fecal sources, and we're right in the thick of the statistical analysis now and the risk factor identification. Once we complete that, um, when Tucker gets a free moment someday, uh, he'll, do the health, he'll do the health risk piece as well for Southwest Wisconsin. So that was called the uh, SWIG study? It's called the SWIG, Southwest, okay. uh, South, Southwest Wisconsin Geology and Groundwater. Okay, great. We'll be looking forward, forward to that for sure. Um, next question we have, has there been any studies that you know of that have looked at whether manure digesters are reducing the risk of pathogen contamination of groundwater? Well, continuing with my baseball analogy, that's like giving a slow pitch to Tucker. Tucker, take mm -hmm. it away. <laughs> yeah, so we've got, a, we've got a paper in review right now where we're looking at um, a, uh, it's, it's a longitudinal study of multiple full-scale digesters. It's probably in terms of the number of facilities and samples involved, it's probably the biggest one out there. Um, or well, excuse me, I'm getting my studies mixed up. That's the other digester study. We have the one published already from 2018, same cross section of samples. Um, the short version is in principle, anaerobic digesters do reduce uh, pathogen levels in manure. There's a few important kind of layers to that. One is, first of all, that full-scale digesters uh, often don't work nearly as well um, in practice as things that are measured in a laboratory, which is where, you know, if you hear people quote removal values, oftentimes they're quoting laboratory values. The real systems frequently don't work as well. Um, and so, so you really have to measure the actual systems that, you know, that you're talking about on a real farm to know what's going on. The, uh, the other point there is if you're talking about something like uh, countywide health risks, say in Kewanee County specifically, and you want to know, do digesters have an effect or are they having an effect? You really need almost, um, uh, you really need almost essentially two studies, kind of a before and after. And, you know, you have to have a bunch of farms that have essentially changed in that time period. Uh, we just don't have... Uh, any kind of empirical database to work off of for that type of study. It'd be wonderful to know uh, because again, in principle, they should work, but you know, it depends on what the specific situation is in, in, in a specific county when you do the study. And Tucker, do you wanna mention the objective of the second study, just so people are aware of it? The second digester study? Yeah. Yeah, the second, so the, I would, the digester studies I was getting mixed up in my head. The first one, which is published, it's in the Journal of Environmental Quality that looks at pathogens and fecal indicators. Uh, the second study is looking at antimicrobial resistance genes. So some people may be familiar with that topic. Antimicrobial resistance is a growing, growing public health problem. There's an ag component to it, an environmental component. And so we've got this digester study where we're looking at the effect of, of digesters on, on antimicrobial resistance in, in dairy manure. That's under peer review right now. Fantastic. So you guys kind of answered one of the questions, which was, you know, where are you guys, what are you studying next? Um, what's happening next? Is there anything you want to add to um, either Mark or Tucker? You mentioned a little bit, but is, what's next on the, on the agenda for studying? Oh boy, Hannah, we've got an 
a number of things. The Southwest Wisconsin study, um, the SWIG study that has been in the news a fair amount, we hope to be able to do public presentations on that uh, early in 2022. Uh, hopefully we can all gather again in public. Um, we are also along the private well lines, we are doing a study uh, with collaborators at Temple and the University of Guelph. Uh, it's actually, uh, ultra, we're installing ultraviolet light units in households in Pennsylvania, some that are a sham, a control, others that are effective disinfection. And we're looking at the reduction in acute gastrointestinal illness um, with the UV disinfection in place. So we're trying to take an experimental approach as opposed to the mathematical approach that Tucker portrayed. We're taking an experimental approach to measure illness in children uh, for that consume untreated private well water. Thank you, Mark. Um, we're gonna be definitely looking forward to that. Tucker, do you have anything else to add? I know you already touched on um, a few of your other projects. Yeah, I mean, I think this the SWIG study is probably the big one for, for QMRAs. Um, I do also have, uh, it's, it's, still, uh, it's, it's still in the review process, but I have a study proposed with, with USDA um, to essentially broaden the scope of the modeling approach we're taking and look at, we're going to try to look at every county in the state. Uh, that will be from a much more pure modeling standpoint, as opposed to the work that I can do with Mark, where we've got the empirical field data. So um, uh, well, it's just less empirical, but it, it could be a very useful guide for trying to decide where we might want to do empirical studies in the future. And it give us give us a more comprehensive look statewide. Wonderful. Um, so we are just about a little bit of, um, ending up here. Is there any last thoughts that you gentlemen want to add um, to the evening? Uh, only Hannah, that um, I really appreciate people's interest in this private well work and the importance of groundwater quality. Um, I think probably everyone attending tonight is aware of how many Wisconsinites rely on clean groundwater for their drinking water. So I just appreciate the interest and the support that we've had uh, the last several years with these sorts of studies. And Tucker, do you wanna to add to that? I, uh, I will only second what you just said, I agree. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you both Tucker and Mark for joining us tonight and asking so many questions or answering so many questions uh, for the attendees. I will uh, be posting this on YouTube again if you want to come back and revisit any of the things that Tucker and Mark mentioned as well as their slides. Um, and also uh, a shout out to again the WEHN uh, steering committee for helping guide the work. Uh, of WEHN and I just dropped in the chat our website, which is wehnonline.org. We have uh, resources, virtual lectures, upcoming events, and our uh, spring co conference uh, series will be coming up in February and March. Uh, and for those folks that are interested in this topic, we do have Mary Ward confirmed to speak about nitrates and water quality on March 16th. So I'll look for that information to come. And again, thank you, Tucker and Mark, and everyone have a good evening. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you.